Do you need a warehouse to sell on Amazon FBA? Well, that is a question that I'm going to answer in this interview. Stay tuned. My name is Obed. I've been selling on Amazon for, I think it's five or six years now. I'm specifically in the book category. I have an operation based out of Arizona. If I'm looking to scale my business, and right now we're doing 50% OA and 50% wholesale, and I want to go into a physical location, talk me through your advice on how I can do that, going from mid six figures all the way up to eight figures. If you're already doing some revenue, it's going to be a little bit easier than starting from zero. So what you have to do is find out if the, where you live is a good place to do business, find out if it's located centrally to trucking lanes, to ports, to big distribution operations that you can attach yourself to and find out if it's worth it to put all your time and energy because it is going to take all your time and energy to open up a warehouse to set up an actual base of operations of where you're at. And if the answer is yes, then go for it. If the answer is no, then you might want to think about relocating. That's what I did. I lived in San Diego. I lived in California and it just wasn't the right place for me to scale. So I decided I got to move out of state and that's where I ended up landing in Arizona. So first decide geographically where it makes the most sense and find out if you're willing to make the move or not. Why is that important? Why can't you just do it from, to say, like LA or California? Well, you could, but you know, ideally you want somewhere that is within close to a major city because that trucking is going to be cheaper to truck product to your warehouse. You want somewhere that has a lot of distributors nearby. If you're doing wholesale or retail arbitrage, anything like that that needs more space, then you at least you have a lot of stores that you can go to or you have a lot of wholesalers within a 10 to 12 hour radius of you, that's going to be a lot easier to ship the product to your location. If you're living in the middle of nowhere, it's hard for a truck to get in. When the snow comes, your product's going to be delayed to be delivered to you. It's going to be delayed to be shipped out. So you got to take all this stuff into consideration if you're really looking to scale. Where are some good locations to think about? You want to be in a red state that's business friendly. You want to be somewhere where the cost of living is not as high. So if you're paying somebody minimum wage, I hope you're not, but I hope if you're paying minimum or slightly higher, you could still get good quality labor and those employees employees can live a comfortable life. So you don't want someone to be struggling to pay their bills and be at your warehouse stressing out because they can't pay rent or they can't afford their food. So typically those tend to be a red state. You know, Texas is great. Arizona, Florida, Nevada is another state that's pretty good. We last interviewed, you actually said you paid above the, st- like the minimum wage. And I think you paid, you said you paid significantly more. Obviously, I don't know the exact amount. But like, why do you do that? Like, why? what was the advantage behind that? Well, it's my opinion that the better that you pay somebody, the higher quality quality individual that you're going to get. Now, I wouldn't start somebody off immediately at you know, the highest price range that you can afford. I would give it a tier system. It's kind of like dangle the carrot and say, hey, here's where I'm going to start you at. But within 90 days, 120 days, these are the targets that we expect. If you're meeting these targets, then I'll bump you here. Make it like an incremental increase, but definitely be honest with them up front and tell them that, hey, we're not just going to keep you at this low wage, but we're going to move you up if you hit targets and you stay consistent. It's important to have a conversation with them also that says, hey, if you're not producing, it's harder to lower someone's pay. You're more than likely going to have to terminate their employment because no one's going to want to go from making $20 an hour to making 15 if they're having a bad month. You're going to have to set the expectation for a reward with higher pay and you're going to set the expectation for possible termination if they don't stay consistent. So let's say I'm doing a million and I'm looking to scale my operation. Right now, we use a prep center and why would we might want to do a warehouse over a prep center? You talked about in the red state, like what's the advantage of that in scaling? Why can't we just keep scaling with prep centers? You could keep scaling with a prep center. At some point, it becomes inefficient. I don't use a prep center, but if I was starting out, I would definitely start with a prep center. But if your volume gets so high that your products are getting delayed at the prep center, let's say you're paying, what's the average cost? A dollar per unit, a dollar, two dollars per unit. Once you're doing over 10,000 products a month, 15,000, 20,000 units, you're now spending $20,000 at a prep center. I can more than likely do the same amount of volume for half the cost. So I could have a $5,000 warehouse and I can have two employees and we can crank out 20,000 units faster and more efficient than any prep center ever can. That's my opinion. Tell me about like what things should we look for? What are the kind of costs should we consider in that? What things should we avoid in a warehouse? Definitely. Uh, that's why the advantage of living in a good state is that the rent per square foot would be lower. So in my opinion, you should go somewhere where you can get the lowest cost of rent. It doesn't matter if it's too hot, if it's too cold. It's just where is most efficient for your business? Because if you do it correctly, you're only going to do it for a couple of years. And then from then on, the operation runs on itself and you can be living in any climate that you choose. If I was to do it all over again from scratch, I would go the cheapest warehouse in the best state that I can at the time. And I would just move there and probably sleep in the warehouse and work 24 hours a day until I can no longer 
longer have to show up anymore. Definitely, that's why it's important to pick a low cost warehouse. Our last interview, obviously, you have a really strong work ethic, and I think you did sleep in the warehouse at some point when you first started the books business. Why do that? Like, why go so extreme? What's the advantage? Of that? I mean, it's not for everybody. Obviously, if you have a wife and kids, then your responsibilities are going to be a lot different than mine. And you know, it's important, I would say, to have some type of balance. But you have to be honest with yourself. If you're starting a company and you're putting all your eggs into a warehouse, you're going all in on yourself. There can't be a work-life balance. You have to be at the warehouse as much as you can. Eight hours isn't going to cut it. 10 hours, 12 hours. Sometimes it just happens to be that you start at eight and by the time you look up and your work is done, it's almost 10 o'clock, almost 11. Sometimes I would work till midnight and I knew I had to be at the warehouse at six in the morning. So, you know, midnight, six, okay, I'll work another hour and then I'll just crash on the couch and then get right back up. So it's not like, I, you know, it's something that was fun for me. It was just that day that those for that stretch of weeks or whatever, it was just the most efficient way to, to operate. You don't have to do that for the rest of your life, but there is going to come a time where you just have to put a massive amount of hours into your location so that you can be successful. Let's talk about warehousing. You talked about cheapest. Can you, do you have some numbers? What would be considered cheap? And what other things should we consider like contract wise that we need to be mindful of in the way that operates? Most places are going to want to lock you in for two years, three years at the minimum. Try to negotiate something. If you can get something for a year, a year and a half, that's a, a goal. Like just lock that down because it's going to give you the opportunity to go hard for a year. And if you need to expand, then you're, you're out of the lease. Or for some reason, you have to close down operations that you're not tied down to a, a five or 10 year uh, warehouse lease. So a year and six months, if you can find that, that's great. But mo most places are going to say two to three years to be able to lease you a, a location. And price wise, I mean, anywhere from a dollar, dollar fifty. I mean, it just depends on where you go. Don't get like the nicest warehouse. My first warehouse, we only had one bathroom <laughs> and there was like eight people working there. So you can just imagine like the, the, the type of stuff that we had to go through. In the beginning, it's not going to be your ideal location. Just get something that has a lot of room for you to work in, a bathroom, a kitchen, and that's it. Just get get started. Like, what kind of size do you think would be a good operation? If you're talking a year and a half, two years, three years, to you know, depending on the contract length. If you're going to go hard, always get a bigger space than you think you might need. That's only if you know that you're going to go in there and go hard because you're going to outgrow your space faster than even you think is possible. If you're truly operating at a high level, you could do a lot of damage with three to five thousand square feet. You said that if you want to process ten thousand units at a prep center, you know, you could do that with three or four thousand square feet, no problem at your own warehouse. Let's talk about operations in the warehouse. So let's say I'm doing a million and I want to go up to eight figures. What does the labor look like in that? And how would you start, like what kind of roles are you looking for? And how would you scale that operation from labor perspective? If you're already doing a million, you're going to be able to afford stuff like a forklift. I'm assuming, you know, you're going to want to get as much material handling equipment as you can afford to make your life easier. If you don't have a forklift, then you're going to have to unload trucks by hand and that's not going to be fun. So now you're going to need one or two people to help you do that. But if you have a forklift, you can unload a truck in 20 minutes and you can do it yourself. Any task that is like a forklift or something specialty, if you know how to do it, you don't have to hire that person right away because you're not going to be having eight hours of trucks arriving at your warehouse. It's just going to be a quick one hour unload. Okay. If you're doing product research or if you're doing something else, you can step to the side and go unload the truck and put everything where it needs to be so that the remaining of your team can continue to work and then you can get back to what it was you were doing. I wouldn't necessarily go out and hire, let's say a forklift operator or a general manager, just hire the most tedious, the least revenue producing task, whether it's like stapling a bag together or labeling a package or putting boxes and taping them. Hire for those tasks first because your time is not well spent doing any of that. I mean, your time is much more better use in the office, growing the business. And if you have to step away for an hour or two to unload a truck or load a truck going out, you could easily do that. Other than accounting, which you can hire out, a manager, which you can hire, I would say 99% of the tasks at a warehouse, you can find somebody to do it or low value. There's only about one or two percent of things that nobody could do better than you at the warehouse. And I'm starting to realize that even now that that's a lie. Like even the stuff that I do, yeah, I'm, that I think I'm like, this is great. I'm the best at this. I'm starting to realize that I'm really not that good at it. And that there's probably somebody better out there than me to do it. And I just need to completely remove myself 100% from the business. So I talked about it earlier. We talked about labor costs. What order would you hire staff? First of all, I would hire this type of person. Then I'd think about this person.
that's another thing about this. Run me through that. Okay, let's say I'm doing a wholesale operation and I'm receiving pallets of material from a distributor. The first person I would do is I would handle somebody that can package my my products. Hopefully, you know how to drive a forklift. You don't need to pay, pay a forklift right away. And if I'm in my office hunting down new suppliers, a truck comes in, I'm going to go unload it. I'm going to go put it in the staging area. You need somebody to take it from the staging area and do that, whatever they're going to do next. So whether they're going to bundle it or they're going to just label it, that is the first person I would hire immediately. Second person is who's going to prep your shipment. Is that person just labeling them and pushing them down a, to the next person who's going to box it up? Then who is that person? Are they going to box it and put it on a pallet and wrap it for you? Once the shipment is palletized and wrapped, now you can spring into action and you can load it back onto the trailer to go into Amazon. So the person that preps and ships, I don't know if it's going to be the same person. Maybe it will be the same person because you don't have enough products coming in. So maybe they can spend half their day prepping and the next half shipping or one day prepping and the next day shipping. So you're going to have to decide on based on your volume. But the prepper and the shipper is going to be your first two key hires. A question for you, if we're going to go up to eight figures, like what kind of headcount organization would that look like if we're doing a whole operation i appreciate it depends on like cost per unit revenue but like you know kind of what range might that that be i think when you talked about in your last interview it's like 30 staff you had for doing eight figures but I'm get, in books is a very manual operation so it's probably a lot higher labor costs but obviously you have much higher gross margins so what would you suspect like in a wholesale operation i think if you were going to want to build an eight eight figure operation i think you could confidently expect that you're going to need at least 25 plus employees so start doing the calculations if you're starting moving to your first warehouse and you have two employees, you got a long way to go. So you need to make sure that you're as efficient as possible, that you're adding quality product into your line to get shipped out. So once you have that, then you add more product. Okay, I need a third person. Okay, now I need a fourth. Now I need a fifth. So, you know, you're about a quarter of the way there <laughs> to get to 25 employees. If, if you have 25 employees or more, I'm pretty sure you're going to be doing close to eight figures. What are the key considerations that you would be looking at in an operation like this that you would be measuring and trying to you know keep on control of? I guess it would be processing units per hour. So if you're processing, let's say, 100 shampoo bottles, then how many units are you processing that hour? It is it going to take you to 50 shampoo bottles in one hour or 50 units? You have to average it out over a long period of time because some units are going to be easier than others. Obviously, if you're doing wholesale, you know, not everything is the same size or the same. It's not shipped properly. But over a period of time, you start to have an average units per hour. That's the first thing I would track. How many units per hour are we getting ready to ship? And how many units per hour are we shipping? That's the first two KPIs that you can start basing your business out of. Any other kind of like key metrics that were really Really quite insightful that you're like actually I think these are quite useful for warehouse operations. Everything's tracked by the hour baby. Uh, how many units are you producing per hour? Anything can be tracked from the amount of breaks that you take to the amount of you know time that you spend you know on lunch. Everything is trackable so the more stuff that you track it's not going to hurt you. So I would definitely track as much stuff as I can but if you're only going to track two things, track how many units you're doing per hour and how many units are getting shipped out per hour. How do you track all this stuff? Is it Google spreadsheets or do you have software you can make anything you want on Google. I'm not a Google expert, but I see some pretty crazy Google sheets out there that track. It's like it's like a 10 page long sheet where you just scroll into the right and there's a new column, a new column for every single thing that you want to uh, track. Do not get a warehouse unless you're really to go all in because it's a big commitment. You're going to be on the hook for a year, two or three years. And it's just a, such a huge risk. So you have to be prepared in that time of your life. If you're going to move to a warehouse, you have to be prepared to give up at least a year working every Every single day, as many hours as you can, and hiring good people around you. The good thing is that when you're working very, very hard, and you can attract people that are working very hard. If you're working 10 hours a day, you might find someone that wants to work 10 hours a day too. And now it gets easier because you're not alone. You have somebody that's working. They're motivating you. You're motivating them. So things get a lot easier when you're hustling. What's life like now? Are you still sleeping in the warehouse? No. Maybe I take a, take a nap every now and then in my office. <laughs> Those days are long gone. I came to the realization that I'm not as good as I thought I was. You know, there's there's a person on the forklift that's much better than I am. There's a person shipping that's a hundred times. I could not come close to somebody shipping and be as, as effective, as good as they are. You know, there's just a lot of people that are better than me and I'm not really as good as I thought I was. 
business. So the more that you remove yourself from every single task, the better your business is going to be. If you think that only you can do a certain task, you are wrong. There's somebody out there that's 10 times better than you and they're probably willing to do it for less than what you're making now. Just find that person and remove yourself completely from as much of the day-to-day as you can. Over, I just want to say, first things first, well done for achieving what you have achieved. It's inspirational about the fact that you were able to achieve that. And I just like, wow, it's amazing the opportunity we live in today. And number two, thank you for sharing your insights and your knowledge today about the tactical step-by-step guide on you say, how to scale your, your business and particularly about looking at physical operations within the US, which is just going to help you grow. This game isn't easy, but I think your evidence that if you're willing to put the work in, anything's really possible. This is the thing I love about the time of the life that we live in right now. There is so much opportunity available. So thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.